thank you all for being here. I know you've just had a uh, pretty big conference and uh, you must all be exhausted. So I appreciate you coming uh, one more time uh, to, to hear a talk. So entrepreneurs, I mean really at the center of every market economy are entrepreneurs. Everything we have around us really is a product of somebody with an idea not just an abstract idea, but the idea that they then put into practice to build something, to create something, to make something. From, you know, my iPhone, to electricity, to every product that we in the amazing modern life that we live, uh, we benefit from is a product of some business person who discovered a profit opportunity and actually took advantage of it, built something, made something of it. Uh, a culture, our Western civilization, doesn't really exist in the form that we understand and we know it today without what entrepreneurs do. And entrepreneurs are, go hand in hand with the kind of economic freedom that we have had over the last 250 or so years. Because what does an entrepreneur need in order to be successful? What is the core of the entrepreneurial activity? Well, it's to think, discover, imagine, figure stuff out that nobody else has. And then have the freedom to express those thoughts in action, to actually go out there and do and execute without permission, without somebody's authority, without somebody's signature, but just to have the idea and to go and live it. And that, of course, does not, did not exist until about 200, 250 years ago with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, with the post enlightenment in Europe and in the United States where our economies were relatively freed up, where entrepreneurs could think without worrying about whether the conclusions they came to might be, the ideas that they had might conflict with what the authorities allowed, with what the authorities permitted, and then had the knowledge that they could actually act on those thoughts. Again, they wouldn't have to ask for somebody's permission. And indeed, the economies that have been the freest have generated the greatest number of entrepreneurs. The economies that have left people free to think and to act based on their own judgment have been the economies that have had the greatest entrepreneurial activity. And as, as we constrain those freedoms, as economies become less free, as we're witnessing in some countries, the United States may be the one that I'm most familiar with, you're actually seeing entrepreneurial activity being restricted. The formation of new businesses in the United States is down over the last decade or so. Primarily, I think, because of the amount of regulation, the amount of con constraint, the amount of permission, authority that one has to get in order to start a business and to sell products, and to hire people, and to do the things that entrepreneurs must do. So entrepreneurship is really at the center of everything we have achieved materially uh, in, uh, in the West. And it's, you know, I, I, I tell students, this is a slightly older audience, so I think you guys appreciate this more. I mean, we live in amazing times. We live in, you know, from a material wealth perspective, it's unbelievably, it's unbelievable how good life is today. You know, our life expectancy, our quality of life, our standard of living, you know, these things we have in our pockets that do, you know, that have only existed for the last 10 years, and yet, you know, have changed our lives in dramatic ways, uh, uh, enhance our ability to communicate, to be entertained, to compute, to find information, to do all these things. I mean, most of the kids I talk to take it for granted because they were born with it, almost. Some of us remember the days without cell phones, never mind without supercomputers, 
super entertainment systems, super telecommunication devices, super encyclopedias in our pockets. All of this is a product of entrepreneurship. And one of the, one of the I, I think, mysteries that applies to entrepreneurs, but applies more generally really to capitalism and free markets, is given how much benefit society, all of us as individuals, have, have received from the entrepreneurial activity for entrepreneurs themselves, why do we trust them so little? Why do we want to control them so much? Why is the perception of entrepreneurs generally, I mean, we all love it when they're small, when they're starting, when they're struggling, but God forbid they be successful. And then we start hating them. I mean, the image I have, the image I have of this is, uh, is recently uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know if you saw Mark Zuckerberg in front of Congress. And here's a, a man, whatever you think of Facebook, that's changed the world. You know, he's got billions of customers, not millions, billions of customers who use his platform, hopefully to make their lives better. Most of it, most of people who use Facebook use it for family pictures and for communicating with friends and stuff. Some of us use it for, for philosophical, activist, political reasons, but then we get upset because of this. But most people benefit enormously from Facebook. It's a platform to communicate with other people around the world. Here's what you should consider a hero of modern business, of modern entrepreneurship. He's changed the world for the better. And these you know, I can say this in this audience, these know-nothing, ignorant, and stupid politicians who created nothing, built nothing, employed nobody, changed the world for the worst, probably, are grilling this giant about technology they don't understand. Like, the, the whole testimony was about a cryptocurrency that Facebook wants to launch and needs permission in order to launch it from the regulator. And Congress doesn't like the fact that Facebook is going to launch a cryptocurrency. And they kept telling him, will you guarantee that it's going to work? And Zuckerberg kept saying, I don't know if it's going to work. We'll put it out in the marketplace and see if people like it, which is the answer an entrepreneur would give, right? As entrepreneurs, we don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work. If we knew, it wouldn't be particularly risky and it wouldn't be particularly entrepreneurial. And yet, they were demanding that he give them a guarantee that it's going to work, otherwise they don't want to allow it. And who are they to allow it or not to allow it? By what right do they have? And the sad thing is, now that was the better question. Some of the questions were about how many LGBTQ people were on his board of directors and how many employees he had that were gay or this or that. I mean, things that were irrelevant to the discussion. But that's what they were drilling on. It was an embarrassment to any thinking human being. And yet, and yet, I'd say most people kind of we're happy that Zuckerberg was under attack. Most people resent these guys. I mean, America in general right now, everybody loves to hate big tech, or big banks, or big industry, or big Walmart, or big anything. Anything big, anything that a, a, where an entrepreneur has been successful, we love to hate. And part of the question is, why? Now, there's a sense in which this has always existed, you know, going back to the 19th century, what did we call in America the, the great industrialists of the 19th century? We called them what? Robber barons, right? Robbers and barons. Robbers because they stole, barons because they were aristocrats. None of them were aristocrats. You guys in Europe know aristocrats. You know, not, yeah, Rockefeller was a poor kid. Carnegie came from nothing. And they built something, they made something, they weren't aristocrats, and certainly they weren't robbers. They produced value. They were traders. They were producers. And yet we hated them then. But it seems that every decade we hate them more, and one of the consequences of hating them and mistrusting them is that we regulate them. We control them. We don't believe them. 
We want to make sure they won't rob, so we put a regulator on every one of their shoulders to check everything that they do, to make sure that what they're doing is appropriate by some standard. So what is it about our culture, what is it about our world that makes us distrust entrepreneurs so much? Why do we treat them as badly as we do? In, in America right now, it's very popular. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC, do you know AOC in Austria? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's made it to Austria. She's big time. Now they're saying a society that allows for there to be billionaires is an immoral society. A society that allows for billionaires is an immoral society. And this is again quite popular. You know, none of those people will probably win the next election. But they're gonna get a significant amount of votes. They're all quite popular, particularly among young people. So what is it about being a billionaire that's so offensive to people, that's so bad? Because what does billionaires do? How do you become a billionaire? Create value. Create value. Lots of people create value. But how do you become a billionaire? Right? Lots of entrepreneurs create value. What's the difference between a regular entrepreneur and a billionaire? Look, other people become millionaires, so you become a billionaire. So other people, can, you allow other people to become millionaires. That's a consequence. But not... There are not people paying for what you give them. Yeah. So not only are you creating value, you're creating value for millions or hundreds of millions of people. And you're creating so much value that people, those people are willing to pay you more than it costs you to produce whatever it is you sell. But the only become, way to become a billionaire is by changing the lives of hundreds of millions or billions of people for the better. Because they're willing to pay for your product. Why are we willing to pay for products? Because they make us better. Because we believe, we engage in trade because we believe that trade is going to make our lives better. So, in a free market at least, put aside the chromism and put aside the, the favors, the rent seeking. In a free economy, if somebody becomes a billionaire, it's because they've created value that millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, are willing to pay for and are better off. So you can't become a billionaire unless you change the world, make the world a better place for hundreds of millions of people. These should be the greatest benefactors of mankind. We should be erecting statues, naming streets after these guys. Instead, we put them in front of Congress and wag fingers at them, regulate them, control them, and threaten them with taxes, now popular in America again because of the left, our wealth taxes. You know, we want to take away their wealth, and people are calculating how high the wealth tax needs to be to eliminate billionaires in America to take so much of their money away so that within 10 years there won't be any billionaires. That's serious. People are seriously making these calculations, which is insanity. If you remember, those of you who read uh, Thomas Piketty's book, uh, you know, what's that? I like to call it Das Kapital for the 21st century. <laughs> and, it's, and it is Das Kapital for the 21st century in a sense then in the 21st century, even the Marxists are unsophisticated, right? Because that book is so unsophisticated. It has no theory. It's basically empirics and, and really garbage theory. There's no economics in it. At least Marx was sophisticated, was a bit philosophical, had something somewhat interesting to say. Piketty is just nonsense from beginning to end with lots of data. And data we know, those of us who have ever done data, you can manipulate, you can play around with it, you can get any result you want if you know which outliers to take out and how to set up the regression analysis, right? Anyway, Piketty suggested a wealth tax of 10% on everybody, globally, so you couldn't escape it, right? And, what, and why, did he say, why did he want the 10% wealth tax? Not to help the poor, because he said, it's not enough money to really help the poor, not on a global perspective. Why did he want the 10% wealth tax? 
to get rid of those billionaires, to knock people down. He said it in the book, to reduce inequality, not by raising the bottom, but by knocking down the top, which reveals everything you need to know about Thomas Piketty, in my view. So why is it we hate them so much? This is where it gets controversial, I think. You know, at the core, what are entrepreneurs doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? Why does, why does an entrepreneur get up in the morning and go to work and work, and they work hard, and work long hours and really, you know, put themselves up? Why, why do they do it? Particularly when they start out, I mean, it's hard work. But all through, I mean, even when they become billionaires, they're still working long hours. Jeff Bezos, second richest man in the world these days, works long hours, works really hard. Why? Self-interest. No. He likes it. What's that? He likes it. Well, why is that not self-interest? Is it liking it self-interest? Yeah, I mean, that's self-interest. The reason they do it is because they love it. They don't just like it, they love it. The challenge, the excitement, the building something, the making stuff. They like to create products in their own image. So it's self-interest, it's, it's, it's liking. Now, you know, it's also, what? It's also money, particularly early on, right? They want to make a profit. And partially you want to make a profit because it indicates that your product has value. The profit is a symbol of, of value. But also because you want to be rich. <coughs> Entrepreneurs go to work. They do what they do. They're engaged in what they do constantly because they love it, because it's good for them, because it's in their self-interest. And what does our culture think of self-interest? For anybody. What is their view of self-interest? Not economically, not politically, but morally. The heart, morality of entrepreneurship, right? What is, what is at the heart? Egoism. Yeah, it's an egoism. What does egoism mean? Is that good or bad? Is egoism good or bad? Good, yes, sir. Well, not according to you, according to the culture. <laughs> what does the culture think egoism is? Good or bad? It's kind it's of embarrassing. Embarrassing. What's that? It's kind of embarrassing. I mean, when I ask audiences a lot of times, you know, why do these people work so hard? And, you know, they, make, they come up with all kinds of reasons, but nobody will say for the money. Because nobody wants to be embarrassed by the idea that maybe, it, but of course it's also for the money. It's not only for the money, but it's also for them. Or self-interest. I mean, people say it, but they were, you know, you even corrected him and say, no, it's not self-interest, it's liking it. Because liking sounds better than self-interest. Self-interest sounds, uh, we live in a culture with self-interest, egoism, selfishness, all these terms are associated with bad stuff. It's embarrassing. Because what does it mean to be moral in the culture in which we live? What does it mean to be moral? To be a good person, to be really, really, you know, where you build statues for you and they make, they name streets for you and and maybe you get sainted at some point or whatever, but, but you know, somebody who's considered morally good. Acting for a higher purpose. Yeah, a higher purpose than yourself. And what is a higher purpose than yourself, usually? You know, some other people, right? Benefiting humanity. Now, what's interesting is that entrepreneurs benefit humanity. So it's not about benefiting humanity that much. Right? I always give the example of Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates, one of the greatest entrepreneurs of the 20th century, certainly. Bill Gates changed the world. He changed the world. There's not a human being on the planet who has not been touched by Bill Gates. Even, even those people who've never used a computer probably are getting their aid because the logistics is so much more efficient because of computers. So even they are being touched indirectly by Bill Gates. He's changed the world for billions of people. And he became the richest man in the world. How much moral credit do we give this great benefactor of mankind? Moral credit. Zero. 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 Negative. He's too rich. Mm -hmm. But we can redeem Bill Gates. He can leave Microsoft, which he did. He can start a foundation. 
and he can start giving all the money away. Now he's a good guy. Now we like him. Not enough to make him a saint. Why? How many people is he going to help, by the way, through his philanthropy? Thousands, maybe tens of thousands. A lot of people. Not as many as the business. But because it's a philanthropy, because he's not making money doing it, it's okay, morally. And because he's not making, building, creating stuff, it's okay, because he's only giving it away. God forbid you make and build stuff. That's no-no. The good stuff is to give it away. I'm not against charity. Charity's great. But all our moral emphasis is on charity. We're within a big battle now, since many years already, to change the kind of morality which comes from very, very long, from a very, very long time mm -hmm. ago, when we were even humans. Well, I don't know that the morality can come from when we were four humans, because I don't think morality is built into our genetic makeup. We can talk about it's why. That goes up. We can it talk about what. Yeah. It's, it's going to. It's being built up through the millions. It's it's being built up, and we can talk about why that is. But the, the important thing right now is to just observe that it is. So here's this guy giving it away. He's a good guy. Still not a saint. We're still not building statues. Why not? What's the problem with Bill Gates today? I mean, he doesn't work. He's not making any money. He's not at Microsoft anymore, so that tainted, the taint of profit is gone. He's now giving his money away, but he's still not at the pinnacle of moral worth. Why? Because it seems like he committed sin and this is just like repentance. Act of repentance like he Yeah, but repentance is good, but, but do, do we really get the sense that he's fully repented? What is he missing? He's still a billionaire. He's still alive. That's, that's a sin. And he's we'll get to that. He's still a billionaire. Yeah, he's still a billionaire. He's still the richest man in the world. He lives in a big house, which he feels guilty for, appropriately, right? He feels, he said, he said, you know, he's got one room in his house. In an interview, he said, I've got a room in the house. That the whole room is a trampoline for my kids. And he said, I don't know if I should feel guilty about that. And I'm like, why should you feel guilty about that? Your kids are having fun. You own the money. What's there to feel guilty about? But again, that morality, I, I, I've got a trampoline in my room. What would it take for him to become a saint? I mean, he'd have to die, but it's not just die. Like if he died tomorrow, it wouldn't work. What would he have to do before he died? He'd have to give all his money away. He'd have to like live in a tent and he'd have to bleed a little bit for us. He'd have to suffer a little bit. Because if you, if you go around museums, I'm sure in Vienna this is true, and you go look at paintings of saints, you won't find any that are having fun. You won't find any that are smiling and enjoying life. They usually have arrows sticking in them and they're some form of gruesome death. Right? That's what it takes to be a moral hero. We live in a culture in which building, creating, making, and eh, Suffering, struggling, dying ultimately, that's good. That's the moral code we live with. It's the moral code we've inherited from millennia. But that is a moral code incompatible with, a, with entrepreneurship. What Ayn Rand does is she challenges that moral code. I think that's a great contribution. Ayn Rand says, the moral code says that I should live for other people, but not just help other people, not just make other people better off, because business does that the best. What the moral code actually says, the modern moral code of the last 2,000 years at least, says is that I should suffer for other people. I should sacrifice myself for other people. I should make myself worse off for other people. And she asks a simple question. Why? Why should anybody live like that for somebody else? Because it's written in a book? Because some philosopher told us? 
But, how, but what is his reasoning? And there is no answer for the why, other than we have decided. We have accepted. Maybe, maybe there is an answer in a, in a way that this is a more difficult sacrifice as compared to being an entrepreneur and having a nice life, uh, being Bill Gates, than compared to dying for other people. Right, so, so but why is dying for other people a good? Why in morality do we view that as good? Not that that is good, but that everyone recognizes that that's harder than the alternative. So is a lot of things in life are hard. Yeah, do we, that seems to be the hardest. Basically, four feet. Yeah, but why is why is morality about what's hard? What is it about morality which says the good versus evil, good versus bad? This is what you should do versus this is what you shouldn't do. Why should you do what's hard? What is the value of hardness? For whom is the value of hardness? There are many several explanations, but I would take also into consideration religious, for example. That all great prophets or, let's say, people have sacrificed for utter good for other people. They suffer that we live today. Yeah. So that's maybe source of such morality. You know, there's no question that the source of the morality is religion. Ultimately, Christ dies the most horrific death possible. For whom? Yes, for sins not he committed, for sins all of us committed. For somebody else's sins, he dies. Right? So the source is ultimately religion. But it still begs the question of why? And Red would argue, I would argue, that there is no logical, rational, reality-based reason. Then at the end of the day, what morality should be is what Aristotle viewed morality as. Morality for Aristotle was not about how to suffer for other people, it was not how to sacrifice yourself, it was not how to inflict, to, to do something hard for the sake of doing something hard. Morality for Aristotle was a guide to how to live, how to live the best life you could live. How to achieve what he called eudaimonia, which is, I know I'm butchering the, 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 you know, how I'm pronouncing it, but it meant happiness, flourishing, living a full life as a human being, living the best life that you could for you. And Rand comes to the same conclusion, morality is not about other people. Morality starts with a fundamental question. How should I live? Because human beings, completely different than other animals, we don't know how to live. Other animals have it genetically coded. They know exactly what to do, they know when to do it, how to do it. We don't say that's immoral to an animal because they have no choice. They're programmed, they're coded. We're not. We have the ability to choose. We have the ability to guide our lives. And we don't know what's good for us. I mean, we still don't know even materially what's good for us. We don't know what food to eat. I mean, it depends which doctor, which nutritionist you talk to, right? Is fat good for us or is it fat bad for us? I'm on the good for us this month. I don't know about next month. I'll read another study and I'll convince me the other way around, right? Even at the level of our material survival, it's com so complicated that we are not sure what to eat and what not to eat. But what about spiritually? What about in terms of ideas? What in, in terms of action? In terms of what we should do on a day-to-day -day basis? What leads to goodness and what leads to bad? What is going to result in a flourishing, successful life and what is going to result in a horrible, awful life? And so that is the fundamental choice that we have, is to live or not to live. And if we're going to live, how are we going to live? Morality should be, ethics should be, a science. In Aristotle's sense, of figuring out what are the actions, what are the values and virtues that we should adopt that lead to a successful, flourishing, prosperous, successful life as a human being. And that's the project Rand engages in. And she proposes some ideas, right? What's, a, what's the most important thing we should be pursuing as human beings in order to live a successful life? What is it that makes 
everything around us possible. What is it that makes entrepreneurs possible? Freedom. Freedom is a consequence. Well, before freedom, freedom to do what? The right to do it. Well, no, it's the ability to think. To it's our ability to use our minds. You have the right to do it. Yes, you have to have the right to do it, but that's politics. That's way downstream from morality. You have to start with what makes it possible for us as individuals to live. And what makes it possible for us as individuals to live is our capacity to reason. Our capacity to know the world, to know reality, and then to apply reason, to rearrange it for our benefit. To figure out the right path in life. All entrepreneurship, I mean entrepreneurship starts with an idea and with execution. All that requires the application of human reason to a problem. And in that sense, you know, it's not just the thinking. It's then, we gotta do something with the thinking to be productive. We gotta apply the thinking, we gotta act on the thinking. So for Rand, for her idea, her idea of morality is an idea of egoism, of self-interest. It's an idea of the purpose of life, the purpose of morality is to help me live the best life I can live, to provide me the principles that will allow me to live the best life I can live for myself. Starting with thinking, with reason, acting on that reason to sustain my life, which means productive activity, means being productive. Now she has other virtues that include honesty and, and integrity and others, but those two are key for the discussion we have on entrepreneurs, because what do entrepreneurs do? They're thinkers, they're rational, to the extent that they're successful, they're using reason, they're observing reality, they're integrating the facts. They're coming up with new ideas. They have to think for themselves. If they just copy other people, they're not going to make a lot of money. They're not going to be successful. They're not going to build successful businesses. They can only build successful businesses by coming up with original ideas that are theirs. And then they're productive. They take those ideas and manifest them in reality and execute and build and create. For when? By definition, they are moral. They're the good guys. They're the mother traces. They're the ones who should be sainted. They're the ones who are ultimately the benefactors of mankind. For the culture, they're suspicious because they're self-interested. Now, what do we know about self-interest? What have we been taught, again, since we were this small, about self-interest? It's bad. It's a sin. It's a sin. And what behavior is it associated with? What do we associate with self-interest? They live at the cost of others. They live at the cost of others. Absolutely. They lie, steal, cheat. They exploit. They take advantage of people. They'll do anything to get their way. And they don't trade with others. They exploit others. They take advantage of others. They don't sacrifice for other people. They expect other people to sacrifice for them. Now, if that... Now, think of that. That's... The buckets, the fire, in our, in our mind we have fire folders. The fire that has on it selfish or self-interested or egoist says lying, cheating, stealing, living at the expense of others. Then we have a file called businessman or entrepreneurs. And in that file it says egoist, self-interested. Which means lying, cheating, stealing, living at the expense of others. Now what do we do to people that we think are going to lie, steal, and cheat, are going to live at the expense of others. Well, we want to control them. We want to make. Sure, we want to catch them. We want to. We have to regulate them. We have to look over their shoulders. We have to know everything that they do, because we know they're going to be cheating. They're going to be lying. They're going to be stealing. Everybody remember uh, Fox News used to have this guy called Bill O'Reilly. Remember Bill O'Reilly is pretty famous internationally. He's an obnoxious interviewer. So I remember in 2002, I was on his show, and he wanted to fire every CEO in America. Why? Because there were a few crooks that were caught. You remember Enron and WorldCom, there were a few of these scandals. And he said, well, of course, he said, all CEOs are crooks, because they're all self-interested. And we should fire them all preemptively. We know they're crooks, just fire them. And everybody, yay. 
because that's we're conditioned to that that we associate business entrepreneur with self-interest we associate self-interest with lying stealing cheating that's what you get we have to because we know we know that if we don't have food inspectors McDonald's is gonna poison us we know that if we don't have elevator inspectors all those elevators are gonna drop and kill us because we know that they live by exploiting other people and as much as we teach people about the economics, we teach people about trade, we teach people about win-win transactions, we can't get underneath, which is where the ethics are, which is where morality is, where they don't trust. They don't trust the system, they don't trust the people, they don't trust the entrepreneur, because it's unethical, because we were taught since we were very little that it's a sin. So I would argue to all of us in the kind of a free market world trying to change the world, mm -hmm. then we're going to have to challenge these ethical beliefs to get anywhere. It's not enough to do the economics and the politics. We also have to challenge these beliefs about morality, these beliefs about self-interest, if we're going to be successful. We have to start with that. The, world, the world today presents us with two alternatives in morality. You can either sacrifice, suffer, that live for others, or you could be a lying, cheating, stealing SOB. <laughs> I suggest there's a third alternative, and that is that you're a rational, productive egoist who is focused on his own happiness, but doing so by producing, by creating, by building, and by making the world a better place. Not because that's your intention, but because that's the outcome. Because nobody will trade with you otherwise. Because trade is a win-win. And the more we maximize trade, the more everybody wins. Mm -hmm. And then that's what egoists do. And I think if we can change that moral paradigm, then our view of entrepreneurs, and our view of capitalism, and our view of freedom will shift as well. Thank you. It takes time. I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Mom, well, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. You know, well, I, I, I'd like to ask you if, don't you believe that in fact, well, this situation, this, uh, the, the atmosphere is artificially created by the, some political philosophy and the education of we, person like the, uh, uh, from the way we were talking about, because uh, even in the United States, if I remember properly, uh, some educational programs like uh, Head Start, something like that, it, it was... Head Start, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it was the basis for education, just for the high school or even the... the, the, the pre, pre, preschool, pre Head Start is preschool, yeah. so like kindergarten. They, 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 they put inside children, from the beginning, very... Uh, 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 special ideas about what is morality in the society. And I can give you an example. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I come from Spain. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure you know Amancio Ortega, who is the founder of Zara. And, uh, so it's, uh, you can imagine that right now there is a, a political party in Spain, in Spain that they try to, to push uh, Amancio Ortega uh, to avoid him to provide very well equipped uh, uh, medical uh, equipment for some hospital and all these things, you know, and all this group try to uh, criticize him because he provides for free yeah. this kind of equipment. Yeah. So it's a kind of of, of of political morality that they try to impose other. Yeah, but I I, I think. I don't think it's any, any particular group trying to impose a, a political morality. I think it's the morality that is in the air. It's, it's in our churches, it's in our philosophies. If you read, if you, read you know, uh, people like, you know, the, the word altruism, which we often characterize this idea of living for others, was coined by a French philosopher called Augustine Comte, C-O-M-T-E. And Comte said, if you, you know, if you, you must place as your highest value the well-being of other people. 
And if you think that by helping them, you're going to be better off, you're going to enjoy it, or you're going to, then it doesn't count as morale. Immanuel Kant says the same thing. So, our basic philosophers who help establish, you know, in the early 19th century, help establish the, all the trends, both left and right, within Western civilization, are all saying the same thing. Self-interest is bad, self-interest is exploiting other people, and you must live for others. Then that, it becomes part of the educational water we drink. It's just in the culture. It's everywhere. And of course, you get it from religion. And if you combine religion with the secular philosophers, it's very hard to combat that. Right? You have to get them when they're very young in order to combat that. It's very hard to combat that. So, yes, I think they get it in the early educational system, but they don't get it in the early education because there's some conspiracy. They get it in the educational system because most people, you ask them, what is morality? They say, yeah, it's living fathers, it's sacrifice, it's, it's Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is the ideal. Right? That's the image. So, yeah, I mean, even when you're trying to do, even when you're trying to give away stuff, they don't want it because you're a billionaire or you're successful. You're, they don't trust you. They don't believe in you. You've got an angle. You're ex going to exploit people somehow. Even the charity you do doesn't count anymore. But that's in the philosophical air. It's in the philosophical curriculum. It's in philosophy departments everywhere. And unless that is challenged, I don't think we can make much progress in changing people's attitudes towards entrepreneurs, and we're not going to change people's attitudes about capitalism or about freedom unless you change people's attitudes about entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for the great talk. I just have one question regarding the, the thoughts on the basis for morality. I have two things that I would like to get your thoughts on. First of all, we think of an evolutionary psychology perspective that that might be the reason why specific morality stances like altruism are more prevalent because maybe in some uh, time in the future and past it was more beneficial to have the person sure. sacrifice themselves to save the tribe from something than have a win-win situation where they say, okay, I saved you from this, but if I survive, give me all your stuff. Sure. And the second part would be, I'm sure you're familiar with the personality types and political positions like Jonathan Haidt sort of stuff. Uh, I get the feeling that there might be a similar thing with morality, like their personality traits type uh, yeah. having different morality senses. So those two things, evolutionary psychology and morality, moral, moral positions and personal. So they're both related, uh, because they both relate to this idea of, of what is within the realm of our choice and what is ingrained in us in personality types, which are really genetically coded, you know, and so on, at least according to some, uh, including height. I'm skeptical of the whole literature. Uh, I'm skeptical of evolutionary psychology. I think I don't think they know what they're talking about for the most part. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples, right? So there are a lot of things that uh, that you have. You, you have maybe right instincts. That's one category. You have emotions. It's a different category. You have inclinations. That's a different category. Propensities talents, and then you have thoughts and ideas. I've never seen an evolutionary psychologist actually go through all of those and define them, and I'm probably missing some, and define them and tell me what is possible to genetically encode and what is not. Because I can guarantee that ideas can't be genetically encoded. Ideas are complex things that one has to have experience with in order to generate, so you can't have ideas. Can emotions be general? Well, some emotions, like the basic ones, like fear and pleasure, maybe, but more sophisticated emotions, don't you have some experience with in order to generate? So it's not clear to me that there's clear clarity within the science of what is and what isn't genetically possible. But they come up with these big declarations, like morality. Morality is a very sophisticated idea. It's, and can you separate? the choices people make, the influence the environment has, and maybe in some way a genetic manifestation of those? I doubt it. I doubt that anybody can today. I doubt that we have the knowledge to do it. And I can almost guarantee that we're not going to find morality in our genes. Morality is too sophisticated an idea, too sophisticated. A th a, a, it's a massive abstraction. And what would it mean if we did? 
Well, what we mean there's no such thing as morality. Because the whole basis of morality is choice. And if it turns out we don't have choice, or at least in this realm we don't have choice, then there is no morality. You can't blame somebody for doing something that they're programmed to do and they have no choice about. There's no morality if you take out that idea. Or if, or if, or if you're pre-programmed to be Republican or Democrat, which I think is ludicrous with all due respect to Jonathan Haidt. Uh, so, so in my view, the whole field is young. You know, they're gonna think a lot differently in 50 years than they do today. There's a lot of stuff they need to know. They don't know much, and I think we put way too much emphasis on it. Morality is about fundamental choices that you make about your life and about the direction of your life. It's not this act or that act, it's more broadly. And there's still the question of I'm gonna die for the tribe, right? Why? Right, and can I overcome? Can I not die for the tribe? Can I choose not to do it? And if I can choose not to do it, are we sure that I did it because I was programmed to do it? Or because I felt pressure from the tribe to do it? And I gave into that pressure? Or because I really love my tribe and I did it for the tribe because I really loved it? Who knows, right? But the idea that that is somehow genetically encoded on us to jump and, and commit suicide, partially, I mean, most of us won't do it in a modern sense. So I just, I just, don't, I just don't think any of that is encoded uh, in it. And one of the great, I mean, one of the underappreciated modern, among modern intellectuals, evolution has created this amazing thing called human consciousness, which is a leap beyond any other animal consciousness that exists because it has both free will and the capacity to reason, which means it doesn't need as much programming as others because it can program itself because of its uniqueness. And by doing that, you minimize the necessary coding that exists in it. So a lot of the stuff that we take for granted that animals have that are coded into it, human beings don't need to, and it's much more efficient because we can create the coding ourselves. So I think free will is a big deal. I think we have a lot of it, not a little bit like, like some intellectuals or like Sam Harris, not at all. I think it's a big deal. And I think that we underappreciate how much of it we have. And by doing that, we give people excuses for how they live. Your life is yours, it's in your control. Take hold of it and do something useful with it.